On today's show, which Cleveland Cavalier is most likely to be an All-NBA player this time next year? Donovan Mitchell made it this year. What about next year? Let's dive in on a new episode of Locked on Cavs. You are Locked on Cavs, your daily Cleveland Cavaliers podcast. I'm Chris Manning. I cover the Cavs and the NBA for outlets like SB Nation, Cleveland Magazine, Just Basketball Show, and more. That man over there is Evan Damerel. He is the founder, proprietor, El Capitan, head honcho, whatever other want to, you know, thing we want to say here of independent site rights on nuclear. Take what? about ten percent off the top there, buddy. But yeah, no, those are all no. things that why, are true. Why should I take my energy down, Evan? We're here recording the Lockdown <sighs> Cast podcast. Your team. Every day, we always, we have Jake Stevens producing. I went on a run after work. I, this is the last time I'm recording in this current setup. I'm excited. I'm being positive. Evan, this is, this is, I told this to friend of the pod and recipient when I saw her in the office uh, a couple times this week. This is positive energy, Chris Manning era. That's where we're at. Are you ready for it? It's, it's teetering on you acting like Jimmy Butler, which I told you before we hit record that if you start manifesting this Jimmy Butler energy, like if there's big man in coughing coming soon, like <laughs> you're going to be putting out a help ad or wanted ad for uh, a new co-host. And I don't think LinkedIn sponsoring us this week. So yeah, no, uh, no LinkedIn right now, but you know what? Look, you just gotta, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna bring it up. We're going to get it going. And we're going to keep this energy going. We're keeping the positivity. What is not, why not be positive? You know, let's let's get things going in a better direction in our Why not be positive? You know, look, we can control. We can control. I four episodes about why we shouldn't be positive. This is the most Evan episode ever. Evan, let's talk about all NBA. So we're going to talk about. I live in a constant state of fear and misery by the current state of our geopolitical stance. That's what. All right. Well, let's talk about for all NBA, though. You just pulling me down, brother. All right. So second segment and third segment, we're going to talk about this year's all NBA team. So Donovan Mitchell is on the second team. I, I would have went him first, but he makes a second. Luka Doncic and Shake Alexander are the first team guards. Mitchell is the only Cleveland Cavalier to make an all NBA team. Darius Garland did not. So that means he is not going to be super max eligible for his contract currently. So he doesn't, he loses some money, but I don't think anyone expected him to get that. But let's, I want to look mm-hmm. forward for a second about that. So right now, let's think about this time next year, May of 2024. Maybe the Cavs are still playing in the playoffs by then. Hopefully you have not gotten sick of me by then. Which Cleveland Jimmy Butler stuff going up? Maybe. Um, well, we'll find out. I'll see you in true. person. Okay. Well, this but time wait. next year, uh, we'll be through my wedding by then. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, look, a lot of things will happen. You know, we'll keep it going. But if you were going to say who is the Cleveland Cavalier most likely to be an all NBA team member this time next year at the end of the 2023 2024 season? That's Who would you say question. that player is? Um, that's a really good question. Uh, full disclosure, uh, as Chris noted, no one on the Cavs got a vote other than Donovan Mitchell, who didn't... Uh, he got votes across the board, so it doesn't matter. He got the most uh, first-team votes out of the second team overall, but points are points. Who cares? He finished seventh place overall in voting points. But um, I was surprised Evan Mobley just didn't get a single vote. We can talk more about this and ditch yeah, on it, your thoughts yeah, on it in answer, a bit. Answer, but answer I my think question. It's, I, Go ahead. Yeah, it's no, going to be Mo- no, it, okay, 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 okay. Is it Mobley? It's yeah. I think it's going to be Evan Mobley just because the defensive upside is there, and it's going to keep getting better and better and better. And I'm not going to say his offense is going to be able to match that defensive level or production heading into next year or all of next year in general, but there's a lot of room for growth and improvement. He's just such a raw and unrefined product that he's going to keep hitting those next levels. And the year three jump is real for a lot of players. I'd assume mobile included And with how astronomically good he is on the defensive side of the ball. And again, with his offensive game, just continuously leveling up. I feel like other than Mitchell, who would make sense to be getting it again, like Mobley has a kind of clean ish path to getting um, all NBA honors next season. 
What what I think that makes next year tricky to prognosticate is that we're going to be in positionless, and That's what fair. that what that means for like like I think centers and bigs are going to be the ones that get cut. Like I I, I think next year if we were to look at this, Demonte Sabonis is a third team All NBA center had a great year. Mm-hmm. I don't know if like Sabonis is going to like be at that level next year if you can just pick like another forward or something or like is Julius Randle like going to make an next year. Does that favor the guards? Does that favor wings? Right. I think I go Mitchell for this just out of like default. That's probably the lazy okay. answer, but this is a guy in his prime. Right. Like he's in his prime and mm-hmm. like, we kind of know exactly what he is. He is had, there's had the best year of his career. I sense we'll have another like motivated Mitchell season as he turns 27 Mm-hmm. I, I think it's very possible it is Mitchell. I, I think Mobley would be my second pick, and then Garland would be third, and then I don't think anyone else has a shot. No, and we have the in the in the grand scope. I guess I just misunderstood the question. Other than Mitchell is what I thought you were asking, but yeah, it's Mitchell for me. Um, it, it's gonna be it's kind of fun to think like yeah, he is entering his prime, and maybe he does have another level to his game that we just haven't seen yet. Like that's exciting to kind of think about now and then hopefully see unfold uh all throughout next season but we we do have the same order um in just terms of like mobley mitchell then garland and we talked about darius garland quite a bit earlier in the week and we touch a little bit more on the point guard play on friday show as well so tune in for that but like garland could be a bit of a wild card as well just because it, it's still going to be him trying to figure out how to coexist with Mitchell. Like I think they're in a good place after how the season ended playoffs, notwithstanding of course, but um, if Garland like just hits another gear or another level and like somehow functions in harmony more often than not with Mitchell on the floor, like that, that could make a legitimate case for him too, because as you said, it's positionless next year. It could be a lot more guard driven because the guy with the ball in their hands more often than not are going to have higher stat counts in general. So maybe that hurts Mobley's case, but just I, I feel comfortable in thinking like, okay, Evan Mobley finished his sophomore season, first team all defense. Um, he was a finals for defensive player that you're like, at least that alone, like yeah. a pretty solid foundation to build off of. And then you're thinking again, the offensive game is going to get better for, on Mobley's side. And if it just continues to level up and just improve, like he's going to, I don't want to say round out, but like keep hitting these levels that are just kind of wild to watch unfold for a guy just as big and as talented as him. If the offensive leap comes from Mobley, this is in play. It, that's what it's about. I think the defensive stuff gets him like in the fringe conversation in terms of impact. Uh, I think, you know, Simmons and Russillo had like a long Mobley all, all NBA combo on their pod at one point. But I think it would have to be like, does Moby get to like 20 points a game or like efficiency goes through the roof? Like, what is the offensive leap for Evan Mobley that would kind of unlock him and allow him to be all NBA? I think that's where I go with him. But it's it's like I think I think it's possible that like they they will get someone again. These things are very competitive. It will stay very competitive. But I think it's at the very least possible. And I think you would feel if you want to feel pretty good about where the Cavs are at. Is that they have like even though coming off the bad playoff loss and all that stuff, they have guys that are going to be in that conversation, and then you we'll see where we go. We'll see if they're playing basketball when they if they get all of the honors at this time next year. All right, today's episode is brought to you by eBay Motors. For a championship team, it's all about making sure every player is the perfect fit. It's the same when it comes to your vehicle; every part needs to fit just right. So the next time you need parts and accessories, head to eBay Motors. With eBay's guaranteed fit, you can be sure every part you need fits right the first time around. Just add your ride to my garage and look for the green check to know the part will fit or your money back. Because just like in sports, confidence is the name of the game when you shop on eBay Motors. And with over 122 million parts to choose from, you'll be back in the game in no time. After all, it is easy to bring home a win with the right when the right parts are guaranteed. Get all the right parts, the right fit, and the right price on ebaymotors.com. Let's ride. eBay guaranteed fit, only available to U.S. customers. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. Thanks for making Lockdown Cavs your first listen every day. Every day is back on Monday. We're going to start diving into the shooting guard spot and talk a lot about, I think, about Karis LeVert as kind of the, 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 op, the kind of one of the other options Cleveland has there and what they can maybe do. Will I talk about Dante DiVincenzo again? It's, it's very possible. So, Evan, 
Donovan Mitchell makes second team All-NBA. Let's just run. I'm going to run through the All-NBA teams. Luka, Shea, Tatum, Giannis, and Embiid for the first team. Mitchell, Curry, Butler, Jalen Brown, Nikola Jokic for the second team. Third team is De'Aaron Fox, Damian Lillard, LeBron James. Ever heard of him? Julius Randle and Damanis Sabonis. What do you think of Mitchell? You mentioned the vote tallies in, in segment one that he got the most first team votes of anyone on the second team. But what do you make of him as a first team guard? I, to your point, in the first segment, I was a little surprised that Luca, um, I mean, SGA does make a lot of sense if you just look at just SGA's body of work this season and just not apply it to the entire landscape of the NBA. But like, Shea Gilchrist Alexander was so vital for the Thunder, and it cannot be understated like how good of a spot Oklahoma City is in going forward, just considering the picks, young players, development, everything in between. But um, I was just surprised that he didn't get those honors just because you and I are in agreement. I think most folks who cover this team would be in agreement. Like Donovan Mitchell was better than Luka Doncic at times this season. I think like, yeah, Luka is an incredible player all throughout, but like the Mavericks didn't make the playoffs. Luka was just objectively terrible on defense. The Mavericks actually Mm -hmm. imploded at the trade deadline. And like Donovan Mitchell, more often than not, was the most vital player for Cleveland on the offensive side of the ball. I'm sure he like wasn't perfect on defense, but he at least tried in that aspect. And he wasn't like a total liability like he was uh, for the jazz for the better part of his time tenure in Utah. So it was a bit of a revitalization for Mitchell, of course. And I think if you just like look at just how Luca played and how the Mavericks imploded and like, there's that expectation for your best player to kind of elevate you, especially when things are as tight as they are. And it just didn't happen. And just turned into a lot of blame gaming and finger pointing in Dallas. Whereas you look at Cleveland, Mitchell fit in really nicely the situation and carried the Cavs into the postseason for the first time in forever with or without LeBron. And I I think that was more first team worthy. And like I said, um, in terms of voting, Mitchell got the most first team votes overall. He had 15 less than Luka, actually, in the grand scheme of things. Point wise, it was about a 54 point difference between the two. Um, so it, there was a bit of a gulf in terms of the grand scheme of the voting and for all NBA, but nevertheless, I, I was surprised that, uh, Donovan didn't get it over Luca. Cause I, if you asked me to fix it and Mitchell seemingly agreed, cause he tweeted FOH after the announcements were made. Um, I, I would flip flop him and Luca just between first and second team. Cause Luca's still great, but I don't think he was first team all NBA worthy. You look at Luca's numbers and they're crazy. Like, they're crazy. And, like, I understand if people want to go to that argument and that's where you end up with it because you look at analytics, you look at his counting stats. They're absurd. I just think I want to reward the guy that was really, really good, had one of the best, had the best season of his career, also was very good by, like, most metrics, like, absolutely one of the best guards in the league last year, one of the best players in the league last year, and, you know, was on a team that won basketball games. Evan, mm-hmm. in, in, sort of by expected wins uh, from Dunks and Threes. Mitchell had thir- was 13. Luca was 15.1. So you have like a two-win difference between those two. I understand supporting casts and all that stuff, but like Mitchell actually won games and played really well. Like it, I, To me, that's where I... If I had a vote, that's where my tiebreaker would have been. If I felt those guys were even or Luke even had a slight edge just because of the numbers, I think I would just favor the winning things yeah i think winning really does trump a lot of this and i know that can be taken into consideration with any of the award voting but like in terms of mvp six man of the year um more often than not it's sometimes the guy who's leading the league in scoring or like in joel and Bede's case just like that two-way impact and things like that as well but um i'm just talking about this season of course but like you said, in terms of counting stats, Luca was otherworldly as he has been for the moment he entered the NBA. But Mitchell's had a pretty outstanding season. Well, like this is his best season overall, which is still hard to kind of fully conceive considering how good he's been from his rookie season out of Louisville to now. And he's kind of just leveled up. And we, we talked about this in the first segment, like there could be another level to his game as he enters his year 27 uh, age wise year uh, in the NBA. And, 
it's just surprising. And I think wins are the biggest factor. Like if you really like trying to break down the minutia of it, like you can make pretty thin arguments, pretty conceivable arguments for both. But then you have to like look at the wins total and Mitchell just resulted in more wins for than Luca did for Dallas. And you toss it up to that. It makes a lot of sense. Do you have, when you look at the other teams, does anything else pop out to you? Is there any other spots on these teams that kind of stick out to you for any, for anyone? Um, I was a little surprised Julius Randle got first team as well. Um, third team. Third team. No, he was third team. I thought he was first yeah. team. My apologies. Mm. Uh, no, I would I'm not surprised if, by that. Yeah. If, if, if I, Randall, I must have if Randall had the got, graphic. Yeah. Um, if Randall had gotten first yeah. team, I think I would have like lost my mind. Stunned. Yeah. Uh, I'm honestly surprised if we're talking about just like the argument of how winning impacts the game. Like, I'm honestly surprised Damian Lillard finished third team all NBA. Like, you could probably make a more conceivable argument for Ja Morant or Devin Booker, who's been otherworldly in the playoffs so far, or James Harden, who's kind of had, it feels weird to say this, but two click career defining games back to back against the Celtics for the Sixers as of late. Like, and by the time this episode drops, or maybe you're listening to it, Philly could be wrapping things up against Boston. But if winning was a factor, I think Dame getting up there is a little surprise. I'm happy to see Fox and Sabonis be on this list as well, just because those two were so vital to what the Kings were doing. And of course, uh, Coach of the Year Mike Brown helps a lot too there. But other than that, I think I'm like looking at the list like more closely now. Like Jimmy Butler, yeah, deserves to be on there. Jalen Brown being second team was a little surprising. There's some contract stipulations with that. Um, but Giannis, Tatum, and Bede and SGA, like, yeah, those all make sense for first team. And then all I'd really do is flip flop Mitchell and Luca. And I think for better or for worse, like you could bump down Luca to third team and bump Dame out and put one of jaw or book or even harden in second or third team and like that's a pretty solid list do you have any discretions or disagreements with these lists you know i i think randall is like third team is not like where i'm i i don't even have like a great counter for like who'd be the forward um Anthony Edwards is pretty great for Minnesota this yeah, year. Yeah, but he, I mean, There's not a that. forward. He's a he's a I mean, he'd be a good like the guard spots. The guard spots are the thing. And if you wanted uh, to like knock Dame for like, I actually, I actually have a forward nomination because I didn't realize this. Like Tyrese Halliburton was sensational for the Pacers, but we had to throw the winning argument out the window there. But like Pascal yeah, Siakam also, too. So. Yeah, yeah, one guard, one forward. I I think like if you wanted no, to no, like Dame Halliburton's like, Halliburton's yeah. listed as a forward and Siakam's listed as a forward. That's that's. Halliburton's listed as a forward? Yeah, he got one third Ooh. place vote as a forward in the all NBA voting. I have the full vote count in front of me. That's, yeah, even though that's, he's a guard for the Pacers, he's technically a forward. That's, and that's why that's like the position incredible. thing is probably makes way more sense going forward for the yeah, that kind I, of stuff. How how <clears> does <throat> anyone get to like vote for how I that doesn't make any sense to me. Um I I I think the I think that the most interesting thing is just the the Boston part of it now because like the the, the contract figures for Jalen Brown are just going to be staggering. But let's actually talk about that here in a second after the trick. We're going to pick that up, talk more about all NBA and the implications. All right. So in a Cavs world, like Darius Garland doesn't get the super max, saves the Cavs some money, gives them some more wiggle room, all of that stuff, right? I'm, I think like every team in the league will be looking at the Celtics to see how they handle what happens with Jalen Brown because like, hey, like they're in this weird playoff position now. Like they, they might be out pretty or pretty soon. Because um, <sighs> the, the knee-jerk Chad- reactions to losing um, a few games to Philly, who's a very good team. They have the MVP on their team. Um, and saying they need to break up Brown and Tatum is, is a little, it, it's funny to me. But, but like, still, so those losses just like aren't good. But like, he's oh no, they're, he's, they're not good. Yeah, um, it could be a coaching issue more than anything. But sure. But like, some of the player stuff isn't good. Brown's now going to be eligible for a five-year, two hundred and ninety-five million dollar supermax this summer. Jason Tatum is going to be eligible for in, in a year from now for a five-year. $318 million Supermax extension in July 2024. I look at these numbers and like the combined salaries for them are going to be like more than like some teams have paid, right? Like, mm-hmm. I, I just like really want to see like how teams that are paying this much for homegrown talent pay. Because like, look, 
it's not it's not likely, at least in this current contract status, maybe on his after going into his third contract, it gets there with Darius and like we'll see what happens with Mobley. But like that, like when you draft guys that are really good, this is the cost can be really, really high. I just I want to see how Boston handles it. And I want to see like maybe what a team like Cleveland, who could face that mm-hmm. down the road, might might pick up and learn from that. It is an interesting case study just because the Celtics are this team who really ripped it down to its core and rebuilt from the ground up and kind of pivoted after those Isaiah Thomas years and just kind of used those Brooklyn Nets picks to catapult what they became now between Tatum, Brown, Smart, Time Lord, everyone in between. Um, and it is going to be an interesting case study because you look at Cleveland, they have Evan Mobley, Darius Garland, Donovan Mitchell. Um, I know Jerry Allen is extension eligible, but he's not super max eligible. Like there's always so much money to go around. And the thing with super max is it is a percentage of the team's like current salary caps. Like that has some weight to it, of course, considering like what the current cap threshold is. And there's like TV money bumps and things like that coming down the line. But like that's, that's a, that's a conversation for when we have more tangible numbers in front of us, but how they navigate this is interesting because the thing that I'm laughing about is just like everyone's like, yeah, they need to break up Tatum and Brown. They just need to end this completely and entirely. And I texted you and uh, producer Jake, the Marrier Stevens about this. Like if the Cavs wanted to be opportunistic and ignore the problematic issues off the court with Jalen Brown, like you could tangibly try and make an offer for Ness, like some type of deal that somehow parlays you Jalen Brown and then your new pseudo core four is Mitchell Brown Garland and Mobley because the three Cavaliers that I mentioned are untouchable so that means Jared Allen is kind of the key cock here and clearly Boston doesn't want it but for the Cavs at least um, Garland isn't super max eligible maybe Mobley becomes super max eligible down the pipeline as well Um, it's going to be interesting to see how teams structure this and I'm still really curious to see the teams that like find ways to circumvent and maybe break the new rules that are being put in place to create this so-called parity across the league. Because you're not going to see these super teams form allegedly, but I think teams are going to be creative and find ways to do it. And maybe Boston is the first team that does it because they are not a glamour market, but like a prestige organization that's in a bigger media market in Boston. And um, they find a way to maintain all this young, overwhelming talent they have so they don't really rock the boat too much and continue being like a legitimate threat in the East. Yeah, I am. I am curious to see like just like what the summer looks like. I I think Jalen Brown for like Cleveland is like a like I think it is a pipe dream just because like I think like oh, someone yeah. like it, yeah like like it like teams at like Houston would be like the one where it's like oh they have lots of picks and things like I just kind of wonder how that um I, I might think look. Atlanta makes a lot of sense. But they traded they're they, like a Trey Young's crap and they just sent Trey Young to Boston. Boy, that's a weird trade. That would be a weird day. But DeJounte Murray and Jalen Brown together would slap under Quinn Snyder. Yeah, and the defense could be really good. But it's just like that's like Trey Trey in Boston would be kind of funny to me. Um, You could really like him or hate him. Yeah. I am just – I am very, very curious to see where we get as far as how – like teams like the other thing that made that stuck with me with Omby is I I've been thinking about like the games played part of it with Steph mm-hmm. Curry who I think was like pound for pound like one of the best guards in, of the in the in the league this year obviously mm-hmm. um but played fifty six games and like I just and like that's gonna like I haven't looked at the full list but like we're gonna have a thing next year where like I I wonder guys guys have to get the sixty five. Yeah, that, you know? I I forget about that rule a lot, and that's that's an interesting footnote because. So like I and then I look at like Devin Booker in this, and it's like that guy played fifty three. I that guy's probably first team All NBA to me if he just plays enough games. Like I think that's where we're at with mm-hmm. some of this, and I'm really curious to see just like do you guys push for this next year, and like what do these teams look like? Do we get like some weird teams next year? Like I, a year from now, this whole conversation could just look entirely different and weird and confusing and like someone that like maybe is a step below the guys that were actually the best players of that season are like they play 60 games and it's like oh can't make it like it's just i'm a year from now i can't wait to see what some of these these teams really look like so let me ask you this as we get out of here who will be the nba's equivalent of tyler huntley making the pro bowl because of um the new ramifications for all nba and such like a julius randall 
it's going to be just the entire New York Knicks starting five is 13. No, NBA. it's it's just Julius Randle because like I think Jalen Brunson, like you know, like that guy's awesome. Randle, I'm a little has had this playoff stuff in the Heat series has been just really bad, really really bad. I bet. Yeah. Well, all right. Let's end there. I agree. That's all that's NBA. It. Yeah, that's all NBA. Thanks again to Jake Stevens for producing. Back at you on Monday. Same time, same place. Enjoy it, folks. <laughs>